everyone. This is going to be your Unit 4A Earth Science Concepts AP Environmental Science Test Review. It's going to include information on seasons, atmosphere and air currents, Earth's structure, plate tectonics, and also El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO. So let's start off with discussing seasons and why the Earth experiences the different seasons that we have. So this comes from the Earth having uh, a tilted axis. So if you take a look at the Earth uh, on our screen right here, notice that the axis which we're looking at right there, is not straight up and down. It's tilted at a little more than 23 degrees. So what that's going to do as the Earth rotates around the sun is it's going to tilt either the northern or the southern, so here's your northern hemisphere, here is your southern hemisphere, toward or away from the sun. So when one of those hemispheres is tilted toward the sun, generally it is experiencing summer. So if we look at the southern hemisphere, notice that a lot of it right here is exposed to the rays of the sun and all of that radiation. So that incoming radiation is going to be stronger. That means that the southern hemisphere will be experiencing summer at that point in time. Now for the southern hemisphere, this is usually going to be uh, in December, January, and February, while the northern hemisphere is actually experiencing winter. And if we can see that the northern hemisphere up here is tilted away, notice it's getting much less radiation coming in at that point in time. So northern hemisphere tilted away means winter during December and January. Southern hemisphere tilted towards the sun means summer in December and January. Now we can tilt the northern hemisphere toward the sun and then we'll be experiencing our summer that in the United States we usually think of being during June, July, and August. So let's spend a little bit more time taking a look at seasons and how the tilt of the earth is going to influence when those seasons occur. So notice that December on the left side right here, so winter in the northern hemisphere, is showing the northern hemisphere tilted away from the sun. So the sun's rays would be most directly coming in at that southern hemisphere point. That also means that during the December solstice around December 21st, we are going to have a day in the southern hemisphere that is going to be 24 hours of daylight. And that is due to, again, that higher amount of sun exposure we have at the South Pole. If we take a look at the other picture on the right side, notice this is June solstice. This means that we'll actually get 24 hours of daylight in the North Pole during that particular time period. Um, so because the sun is now having much more radiation and heat coming in at the North Pole, it's summer, which is what we normally think of in the United States again as summer during June, July, and August, whereas the Southern Hemisphere is tilted away. And notice that the South Pole is not really getting any direct solar radiation, hence why it's so much colder and why it would be winter at this time. So what we normally think of as Christmas time or December for us, um, we will see a uh, very wintry weather season with lots of snow and colder weather in the Northern Hemisphere, so during December. But in the Southern Hemisphere, if you can see Santa chilling out over here on the beach, um, he will be having his uh, Christmas time during the summer if it's the Southern Hemisphere. So just think of Christmas in Australia, it will actually be very, very hot compared to Christmas in um, the Northern Hemisphere or in North America, for example, uh, it's going to be much colder. All right, so let's move on to talking about the atmosphere. So there's two big time layers that are going to be important as far as the AP exam and the test for our class is concerned. Um, that is the troposphere and the stratosphere or the bottom two layers of the atmosphere. Um, notice that we also do have the mesosphere above those two, the thermosphere, and then the exosphere as we approach space. But for the sake of environmental science, the troposphere and the stratosphere are the two that you should definitely remember. So the troposphere is going to contain gases um, such as oxygen, nitrogen, uh, water vapor, H2O, and then also carbon dioxide, all naturally existing and all very important for helping keep us warm. Um, so the troposphere is where the majority of the greenhouse effect will take place. And again, this is those gases such as carbon dioxide and water vapor trapping the incoming solar radiation to help keep the planet warm. And as we discussed in class, we know that the greenhouse effect has been intensifying due to anthropogenic carbon dioxide production, which means carbon dioxide that people are producing. Um, the troposphere is also where weather is going to take place. So we will have storm clouds, for example, um, in the troposphere range. So notice that's from zero to 10 kilometers above the earth. So probably about zero to six or so miles. 
The stratosphere is located above that, and that is where the ozone layer is going to be. So the ozone layer is going to wrap around the Earth, and it is going to be full of O3, which is the chemical abbreviation for ozone. And ozone's job is to help uh, basically absorb incoming UV radiation that would otherwise do quite a bit of damage to the human body uh, or any animal body for that matter. So if we did not have the ozone layer, we would probably be experiencing quite a bit of DNA damage, uh, definitely cancer, things like eye damage as well. It would be very unpleasant. So we definitely want the ozone layer there. It helps protect us from incoming radiation. And again, that is part of the stratosphere. Um, so the stratosphere does contain it. And then another thing to keep in mind is as we go north out of our um, atmosphere, we will be approaching space. And that is going to uh, basically have a trend of getting colder and our gases in the atmosphere thinning. So most of the gases in the atmosphere, especially oxygen, are going to be mainly located in the troposphere very close to Earth. So we'll see O2 hanging out down here, CO2, carbon dioxide, water vapor, H2O, most of that is going to be found in the troposphere. One of the things we talked about back with biomes was air circulation, um, because air circulation has a lot to do with how our biomes, um, such as deserts and rainforests near the equator, form. Uh, so we reviewed that with this particular unit as well. So we talked about the Hadley cells found just above and just below the equator uh, and how those actually influence our climate. So climate is temperature and moisture of an area. So the general pattern. So is it, for example, very warm and very wet, like a rainforest, or very hot and very dry, like a desert? Um, so with Hadley cells, they're located right where, where the um, equator is going to be. So you can kind of consider this middle point right here, our equator. And then heading towards 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north, uh, we will be experiencing uh, this particular type of circulation. So notice that at the equator, because there is so much direct sunlight coming in, we see quite a bit of moisture, and that moisture is going to be evaporating due to that heat. Well, what happens with that is that moisture evaporates up and forms clouds, which then end up raining out pretty much on top of the equator, causing rainforests to form. But then the remaining uh, air is going to continue to circulate up, and this air is going to cool and it's going to dry out. So as it cools and dries out and rises, um, it will eventually begin to circulate down toward the earth again. But this time when it circulates down, it's going to still be dry, but it's going to begin to warm up due to solar radiation. So as it warms, now we have that warm, dry air falling back down again. And so what we end up having happen, as we learned about with biomes, is that deserts form at the 30 degree south range and the 30 degree north range. So let's move on to the structure of the interior of the earth now that we've looked at how our seasons and atmosphere um, influence our climate and environments. Um, so what you need to know for the earth's structure uh, is mainly a couple of vocab terms. So we need to know the crust, which is the outer part of the earth. So you can see, for example, the mountains right here. So the crust is essentially where we are, what we stand on. Um, the lithosphere is going to be not only the crust, but also the top um, kind of solidified part of the mantle. So what we're seeing right there, which sits on top of the asthenosphere. And what the asthenosphere is, is kind of the upper partially melted part of the mantle. And it's important because it is going to allow uh, for movement of the plates that we have. So like, for example, the Nazca plate or the Caribbean plate. Um, so as those plates are pulled around uh, by the movement of the asthenosphere, they might run into each other, they might pull apart from each other. And that movement is mainly driven by convection cells, which is circulation within the mantle. So for example, if we had circulation like this, we might see this plate moving to the left. And if there was another plate, say over here, it might run into it. Um, it might be pulling away from a plate maybe found over here on the right side uh, and creating a different type of plate boundary. So let's go ahead and take a look at those plate boundaries next. So the first type of plate boundary that I want to review with you is subduction zones. And subduction zones are a convergent plate boundary because they do come together. So we do have the plate boundary moving toward 
each other. So notice the oceanic crust on the left and the continental crust on the right, and they are coming together. Well, the thing is though, oceanic crust is a lot denser or heavier um, in this case than our continental crust. So it actually gets forced down back into the mantle and all of this down here would be melting and kind of becoming part of the mantle again. Um, notice what is forming though with these subduction zones. We can get volcanic mountain ranges where the actual edge of the zone boundary is. We could get trenches often in the ocean. We could also get little islands forming out here as well. So if this continental crust was shifted a little bit back towards the right, we might see an island arc forming out here in the ocean as well. So with our subduction zone, quite a bit of the land formations that we see out and about um, may be due to that. So for example, down in South America, we see the uh, Andes Mountains that have been formed right on the coastline edge, and that is due to a subduction plate right on the western edge of South America. Okay, the next type of plate boundary I'd like to review is your transform boundary. So with these, the plates are going to be moving past each other um, at kind of the same level, so parallel but opposite directions. So notice this one's going this way, this one's going this way. We don't have one really being forced over the other. They're not pulling apart. They're kind of sliding by each other. Um, and this will often result in earthquakes. Uh, one of the famous transform boundaries is the San Andreas Fault that is seen in California. And that is part of the reason why California does experience the earthquakes that it has on a regular basis. All right, we should also be familiar with your divergent boundaries as well. Um, and what this is going to be is plates pulling in opposite directions, so pulling away from each other. And keep in mind, too, that while, like, for example, this left plate is pulling away from the right plate, there may be a plate over here on the left that is actually running into. So on the left side, there may actually be a subduction zone there. Um, but down the middle of this particular boundary right here, we have these plates separating. Um, so what divergent boundaries are known for is creating things like mid-Atlantic ridges, um, which we know runs right up the Atlantic um, and actually all through Iceland as well. You can snorkel right through it. We showed that picture in class. Um, and we also can have things like rift valleys form as well. So uh, there is a rift valley that is humongous in Africa, and you can literally see the edges of the plates as they've pulled apart. Um, the other big thing we should know with this is that as these pull apart, where I kind of drew this line right here, uh, we create some new crust as well. So all of the melting asthenosphere beneath that would fill this back in, and it would end up cooling and creating a new little layer of crust. Okay, in relation to plate tectonics, you should be familiar with a few things about earthquakes and tsunamis. Um, so let's start with tsunami since that's a brief review. Um, tsunamis are caused pretty much by earthquake movement under the ocean. So what will happen with that is as plates move, it's often rapid and it causes big displacement of water in the ocean. And that is going to end up forcing a wave up. So let's say we've got the bottom of the ocean right here. We've got some water on top, um, and let's say this is our plate boundary. Well, if all of a sudden this gets shifted upwards due to maybe a subduction zone forming, this water is going to have to go somewhere, and it often will get shifted up and then begin moving very, very fast towards shore. And that's actually going to create your tsunami um, that can then do quite a bit of damage uh, on shorelines and to coastal ecosystems, for example, by burying mangroves, by damaging coral reefs, destroying um, trees there as well. So land-based and water-based ecosystems. As far as earthquakes, what you need to know is uh, the magnitude of an earthquake is the severity of its shaking. So how much does it move side to side? Amplitude then is going to be the height of the seismic waves created by the quake itself. So for example, if I draw this little squiggle, okay, our seismic waves are from here to here. So how wide are those waves? So from here to here. Whereas the up and down um, is going to be our amplitude. So again, our magnitude, so how far apart these are, and our amplitude, how high they are. So what I showed you guys in class to kind of help you remember that is if we look at that, Notice that the side to side part kind of looks a little like an M. And then if we turn these into A's, the actual height right here is going to be our amplitude. A to help you remember amplitude. 
All right, the last thing we need to review for this test is ENSO, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, which is changes in the ocean temperature uh, where the ocean is found at the eastern tropical Pacific. So this is actually located to the uh, western end of South America, kind of close to where Ecuador is. Uh, and we get a warm kind of blotch of water that stretches out toward Australia. Um, La Nina is the opposite effect. Instead, we get cooler temperatures that occur in the water. Um, and these are cyclical. They'll happen every so many years. Um, and then what's going to happen as far as El Nino affecting climate is worldwide, we could see changes that might be drought in some areas, intensifying hurricanes in others, maybe warmer or cooler winters, um, depending on the location. But one of the big things it does as far as the food chain is concerned is it's going to suppress upwelling. So if we take a look at our picture on the right, notice our arrow coming up from the bottom of the ocean toward the surface. Um, this is actually caused by wind moving kind of perpendicular across it. Um, the stronger that wind, the stronger the upwelling usually is. When El Nino occurs, upwelling is actually suppressed because that wind is not really occurring anymore. So what we'll see instead is this is not as strong, upwelling also will decline. And then we'll see things like phytoplankton decline um, or any other kinds of producers in the ocean, algae, etc. And that means less producers um, equaling less consumers. So if you have less food available to the upper levels of the food chain, they will also decline as well. So generally El Nino can cause some trouble for organisms that live near the ocean. La Nina, on the other hand, actually increases those wind patterns. And we also see an increase in upwelling. All right, thank you so much for joining us for this review for the first half of Unit 4 for AP Environmental Science. Um, your testing class tomorrow is going to be um, multiple choice questions. You will not have an FRQ on this exam. So thank you very much for watching this video, and I hope it helped.